Today we have a crazy nuclear revenge story against an awful co-worker. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, I made my sister's fiancé end their engagement just a fortnight before their wedding. My sister and I grew up on a farm in one of the most rural areas in the entire country. Yeah, we were born and raised in the ghetto, except that I raised her and my baby brother. My mom was an alcoholic before she died, and dad was too busy working different jobs to ensure that we at least ate and finished high school. I did everything for my sister. She was like my child. And since there's an eight-year gap between us, I was burdened with the duty to care for her the minute after she was born. At first, I took care of my brother because mom and dad were too busy working and because mom was very uninterested in being a mother. Later on, it was because mom was so deeply unhappy that she turned to alcohol as a form of escape from her sad life. Our mom married her high school boyfriend after she got pregnant right after high school. She gave up her dreams of becoming a photographer and instead married my dad and stayed on the farm. For a long time, she felt very unsatisfied with the life she had with my dad. We hardly had any money and we were still living in the same town that she grew up in and hated. My dad tried many times to remedy the situation and fix her unhappiness and deep satisfaction with her life. He encouraged her to leave and try to go back to her passion but mom was too discouraged to do it. She had lost all faith in herself and was too scared to take that leap. She told everyone that she wasn't leaving because she had children to look after and raise. But she was literally not taking care of her children. The only person she cared for at first was me. As soon as I was six, she neglected me and she did the same for her other two kids, my brother and sister. I was my sister's big sister and mom in nearly every way. I babysat her, taught her to wash her hands, washed her hair, and oiled and braided it too. I taught her to dance, did her homework, and looked very good and well-groomed, even though we didn't have a lot of money. When I was old enough to get a job and buy some nice thrift clothes for myself, I'd let her share my clothes with me and even gift her some of them. There were times when she wanted the kinds of shoes or jeans that everyone was rocking. She would come home and cry about it. As a good big sister, I'd save up and buy them for her. I gave up everything to take care of my little ones. Even when I did get a chance to leave the farm, my boyfriend from high school was offered a job in the city and wanted us to live together, but I refused to go with him. That led to the end of our relationship, but I accepted it. I just couldn't leave my siblings alone, nor could I leave my mother. I was the only one who could take care of her whenever she got drunk and blacked out. I cleaned her up and cleaned up after her. I also couldn't leave poor dad to do it alone. My family meant the world to me. I was willing to do anything for them because I believed it was my responsibility to do just that, to sacrifice for them even. My dad would tell me, you're the woman of the house now, but I wasn't a woman or the woman, I was just a child. My life revolved around my parents, especially my mom and siblings, but my siblings were allowed to be children and have other interests outside the home and family. I didn't just feel guilty whenever I did something for myself. My parents, especially my dad, would make me feel like the devil for choosing myself. My sister was the youngest of the three of us, so she was treated like a princess. Everyone, even my mom, adored her and loved her. My mom was almost completely incapable of mothering her when she first had her because she was in and out of rehab. But the few times she had contact with my mom, mom treated her nicely and poured so much love into her. The kind of love that I wished my mom had for me. Now, I understand that my mom was only capable of showing that much love because, at the time, she was already making progress in her treatment and was getting better at relating with people. My sister got all the love and became very spoiled. Because of the things that I gave her, she was able to be friends with many of the popular girls from middle class families in her school. She started to compare their lives to hers and soon became desperate to leave the farm. I don't mean to be spiteful, but my sister is a cheat. She cheats on everything and she cheats on everyone. She was always constantly looking for shortcuts and an easy way out in life. And somehow, that almost always worked for her. All she wanted to do was get out of the farm and make something out of her life. She was ambitious, but overly so too, and she kept going about it in the wrong way. I started to have problems with my sister when as a teenager, and those problems led to a permanent strain in our relationship. I noticed my sister did not want to be seen publicly with me or any member of our family for that matter. She would avoid us and say that we were embarrassing her. Now, I know that teenagers often didn't want to be smothered in public and may want to establish their individuality, but I noticed as she grew that she was not just a teenager, 
My sister genuinely found our family repulsive. When she was 16, she started to date a guy whose parents had a lot of money and was quite popular in his school. She lied about her family and told him that she was adopted by the family of the man our dad worked for. I found out about her lies when I eavesdropped on a phone conversation she was having with him. I was shocked to hear her spin so many lies and so expertly too. The effortlessness just showed me that it was probably not her first time lying about something like that. At first, I felt bad about eavesdropping, but when I heard her, it put a lot of things into perspective that I'd been worried about for a while. I asked her about it later and she denied it. It wasn't until I told her that I heard her that she confessed to me that she'd been lying to the guy because she was ashamed of her actual family. I felt guilty about it. A pang of guilt I had carried around for a very long time, but wasn't even mine to carry. If anyone should feel guilt, it was my mom and maybe my dad. I was just a child in the family and as much a victim as she was. Rather than try to help her see why she should be content with the cards she's been dealt in life, I decided to make sure that she got everything she ever wanted. I got her clothes, shoes, and everything nice, but her lifestyle became even more false. She used those clothes and shoes to support her elaborate lies about how rich her actual family is. Her delusion and lies were too much, but I figured she'd outgrow them in the future. Each time I confronted her about her behavior, she'd yell at me and tell me she had no plans of being an underachiever like me and our mom. I started to avoid her, but even that wasn't enough. She'd verbally attack me at the slightest disagreement. Every name she called me was a blow to my self-esteem. I was already struggling, but my sister made everything worse. When she finally moved out of the house, I was relieved because I no longer had to deal with her disrespect. She disrespected me so much that I was weary of coming home after work every day. Nobody could check her, not me and not even my parents. She was rude to everyone, but especially rude to me. The disdain was too much and all I ever did was love her and treat her like she was my daughter. After she left, I was still willing to maintain a relationship with her. I figured that since she was an adult living out in the world on her own, she'd have more experience and would understand me more. I was wrong. So wrong that I could shed a tear just thinking about how wrong I was. I called my sister often to say hello and ask how she was settling into the city she moved to, but she never called me. Except, of course, when she needed my help with something. Not only did she never call me unless she needed help, but even when she called me to ask for my help, she would totally behave as though she was doing me a favor by asking for my help. Years passed and my sister came up quite a bit. She met people and established connections and soon started making money. It was all nice until she decided to get married to a rich young dude. He was someone I'd seen on TV a couple of times, famous for being that rich even though he was quite young. I knew from the moment I saw their picture together in one of those glossy magazines that she had told a crap load of lies to get a guy like that to want to marry her. I was correct. We knew something was wrong when she refused to introduce us to him. My parents never met him, dad was too old and tired to care, and mom had completely given up on her. I, on the other hand, just couldn't. Perhaps it was because I raised her, I couldn't look away. My brother wasn't bothered about her at all, not in the least. I was in the city for one week and decided to stop by and visit my sister. She vehemently refused when I asked if I could come and visit her. I live with my fiancé, she said, as though that explained very simply why she didn't want me around. Oh, that's nice. When am I going to meet him? She said, what? No, please. No. No. Nobody is meeting anyone. Why not? I knew just why my sister wouldn't want me or any other member of our family to meet our fiancé. We didn't look like the kind of family she'd want him to meet. Listen, I had a rough childhood. I'm really trying to start over right now and I can't bring all that mess into my relationship. I said, what are you talking about? What mess? My sister looked back and suddenly got up. I have to go. This was a mistake. I looked in the direction she looked at and understood why she got up. She had seen her fiancé. As soon as he saw her, he started to walk toward her. He grabbed her purse and started to walk him today. He kissed her briefly on the cheek and pointed to another table where a group of other men were seated. I was embarrassed and picked up my purse to leave. As I walked past them, he said hello and I casually responded. She was my nanny growing up, I heard my sister say. She practically raised me. Mom was always too busy with her pastoral duties. My jaw nearly dropped. I was shocked that she'd refer to me as her nanny and at the same time, amused that she lied to her fiancé about her mother being a pastor. 
my parents were completely irreligious. My dad was in fact irritated by religion. He always talked about how his parents were very religious and dedicated their entire lives to serving God, but got nothing out of it. My mom was uninterested in religion, so she never even bothered with it. When I got home and had cried my eyes out, I searched online for her fiancé using his full name and found out that his dad was a preacher. I understood then why my sister lied about our mother being a pastor. My sister's only contact with the church came from the times when she went with her friends to church just because she wanted to be around those friends. I knew my sister well. I knew she just wanted to be married to this man long enough to take his money, and I decided that I'd sabotage their engagement even if it was the last thing I did. A few weeks after their wedding, I went to the company where her fiancé started and tried to see him. His secretary was insistent that since I had no prior appointment, I couldn't see him. I went back and returned the next day. She gave me the same response and asked if I'd like to drop a message for him. I told him I was his fiancé's mother and she called him and relayed my message. A few minutes later, he walked out and ushered me into his office. I told him everything he needed to know about my sister and he was stupefied. I was going to tell him and leave, but just as he was trying to get himself together after my revelation, my sister walked in. It turned out that my sister had lied to her fiancé that her parents were pastors, who died in a road accident when she was a teenager. She told him that she had one brother, but he cut her off when he didn't approve of his lifestyle. My sister did not expect to see me with her husband. She didn't see that coming at all. I'd always been the sweet sister who tolerated all the disrespect she threw my way. She expected that I'd just ignore her telling her husband that I was her nanny. Her husband asked her about all that that I told her, and she suddenly burst into tears. He stormed out of his office and she ran after him. Just like I did at the restaurant, I picked up my purse and left. Two weeks before their wedding, her fiancé called off their wedding and asked for his ring back. That was how I got back at my ungrateful, bratty little sister. I do not regret my actions one bit, and I'm learning now to be selfish and make up for my lost childhood. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad for OP. I feel bad for anybody that gets parentified or forced into a role where they at least feel like they have to pick up the slack and especially care for younger kids when they're still just a kid themselves. I honestly hope OP's still able to connect to their childhood and make up for lost time, however that may be. That said, our next story is, my coworker will never test my boundaries again. I used to be a proper team player, never exactly liked taking the lead, but I was good at following orders and sticking to the game plan. Back in high school, I was part of numerous award-winning teams. Maybe not as a key member, but I always did the job that was asked of me, and just loved being part of any team in general. Absolutely no one told me that working in teams would be so difficult after high school, but looking back at it now, I think it was probably the presence of teachers and team coaches that made it work because as soon as I got my first job, I quickly realized teamwork wasn't always the dream work. Fresh out of high school, I needed to get busy so I could make a little money for myself, and certainly not as an excuse to leave the house, if you know what I mean. So I went job hunting. Most of the jobs I wanted weren't willing to hire a 16-year-old kid whose only qualification was that they finished high school, so I had to look for the ones that just needed people, regardless of qualifications. I was able to find two jobs which were available to me, a cashier at a supermarket and an assistant at an electronics store. The position for the cashier was much more competitive than I thought. I was competing against people twice my age and actual tertiary institution graduates, so I knew my chances were low. My only hope was that I was great at punching numbers, so I still felt positive about my prospects. However, after passing the test in flying colors, it turned out that there was indeed an age preference, as someone who scored slightly lower than I did was picked ahead of me. No biggies though, I just picked myself up and took the fact that I was able to stay away from my mom's nagging for a full day as a little win. The position for the assistant at the electronics store was more straightforward though, as it seemed they desperately needed some extra hands in their large store. That was how I got my first job. I was so excited and looking forward to my new journey. I didn't even mind what the pay was. I was just happy to be paid for leaving the house each weekday. You know, youthful exuberance. It took only the first day of work for me to realize that my happy-go-lucky attitude might not cut it there. I was much younger than my soon-to-be co-workers. In fact, I was the only non-adult working in the entire store. 
I wasn't phased by this though, as I felt my eagerness to work would overshadow whatever issues age difference might have caused, but I would soon learn that it wasn't going to be as easy as I thought. After settling in and signing all the required documents, the head of operations decided to show me around the store and what department I would be working in. He also introduced me to my new co-workers and the head of my department, or HOD as they were called, who then explained my roles to me. My head of department was a mean looking man. He was quite tall and spoke really authoritatively, like those teachers I used to dread in high school. He just had that aura of a no-nonsense person and I could tell by the reactions of my co-workers whenever he spoke. It was obvious people feared him, but I was there for a good time and not a long time, so I didn't exactly put much thought into it. My department was in charge of physical inventory. They were responsible for making sure every item that comes in or goes out of the store was accounted for and categorized properly. I personally was tasked with categorizing inventory, so I basically had to neatly place items where they belonged. The orders were already denoted. This wasn't exactly an arduous task, except on those days where we received hundreds of new or returned inventory, which happened max 5 times a month, so I was idle most of the time, which meant I could use my phone more. Now, using phones was not illegal in the store, but due to adult eye service, it appeared to be bad optics, so you just had to look busy even when you have absolutely nothing to do. At least that's what my coworkers did, so I wasn't surprised when a few of them showed discomfort towards seeing me use my phone while they had to appear busy. Most of them were willing to keep a tight lid on it though, seeing as I was just a teenager who brought good vibes and reminded them of their younger days but one of them in particular spared no time to remind me of her disgust towards my bad workplace behavior. She was the store manager, and even though she worked with I and my coworkers, she was basically the one in charge of the store floor, as the head of department was always in his office. She oversaw the recording of movement of inventory in and out of the store, so she usually acted like she owned the place, and I could tell some of our coworkers hated her guts. As time went on, I kept on using my phone during my free time and everything seemed quite normal. Until one day I got a call from the head of department. He had never requested for my presence in all the weeks since I got employed, so I wondered what the problem might have been. I initially thought I'd probably placed some inventory in the wrong place, so it came as a shock to me when he said that I'd just been reported for using my phone during work hours and also gave me a final warning to desist from using it during work hours. Only my coworkers had ever seen me using my phone in the workplace before, so I instantly knew it was the work of a snitch from my department. I had one main suspect, and my suspicions proved to be right as when I got back to the store floor, the store manager, wearing a big smile on her face, told me she had repeatedly warned me and that I should be careful about using my phone in the workplace. She knew I knew she was the one, and she didn't hide it, but that was okay. I still had my teenage rebellious spirit, so I personally decided I wouldn't listen to what Jezebel had told me. Jezebel was what I began to call her in my mind from then on, so I kept using my phone during work hours although I tried to be more discreet, especially when Jezebel was close by. The store was quite big and we usually stayed on opposite ends of the floor. My new tactic for using my phone worked quite well for a few weeks, and it seemed like I was a genius for not getting caught by the ops. That is, until I was. It was a Tuesday, a few minutes before our lunch break, when I decided to pull my phone out early, as I was already done with my morning tasks. In my mind, I didn't need to be discreet as everyone was basically getting prepped for lunch, so it looked like safe territory to me. I began to use some of my favorite social media apps to know what my friends were up to. When I heard someone say, Give me that phone right now! I looked around to see who said that, and there Jezebel was, standing with arms akimbo. I asked why, and was about to place my phone back into my pockets when I saw our head of department standing behind. I'm not going to lie, I started to feel the fear most of my coworkers felt around his presence. He immediately made himself seen and asked me to obey the command of my superior. I felt like I was in high school all over again. He had apparently been observing me from a distance. I suspected Jezebel might have put him onto it, 
so I had to drop my phone with her, which was no big deal, as long as I got it back after lunch, or in the worst case scenario, at the end of the workday, but Jezebel had other plans. She told me she was going to hold on to the phone for 24 hours so I could finally learn my lesson. I thought she was bluffing. There was no way she was going to hold on to my phone for a full day. That was insane to me, but being the sadist she was, she locked my phone up in her locker at the end of the day and actually went home. I was stunned. I had to go home without my phone. I couldn't report to my parents because they would have supported the decision anyway, so I had to take it on the chin and think of how I could get back at the most evil woman I'd ever set my eyes on. I may not have mentioned this earlier, but I was the most computer literate employee on the store floor. So I would occasionally help some of my coworkers do stuff like record inventory movement, and the coworkers here included, you probably guessed it, Jezebel. She was in charge of presenting the general monthly inventory records to the head of department or auditors, and on some days when she was occupied, she would ask me to do the daily updates, which I did without question. There was a third quarter audit coming up in a few weeks, so my plan for revenge was pretty simple. I would alter some of the figures in the official inventory records whenever I got the chance. And with the third quarter rush on, I had a lot of chances as she was always occupied due to the increased market activity during this period. I had to be smart with the alteration of figures though, as she tended to run personal checks occasionally, so I tried not to skew the daily figures too widely, but the more chances I had, the more I could affect the monthly balance. In total, I had five attempts at updating the daily records, so I was able to affect the balance of some of the inventory by as much as 15%. I felt even more satisfied when she shoddily ran her own pre-audit checks and could only find a couple of errors. She might have thought I was too scared of her after the phone incident, that she suspected no foul play, and didn't bother to do a physical inventory check of her own. The day of the audit finally came, and as usual, it felt like you could cut the tension in the air with a knife. Audits were usually taken very seriously by the people in charge. There was very little room for error. Even in the dress code, people put on their cleanest outfits and uniforms. Everywhere was spotless. The entire store looked brand new because the owners of the store chain usually came along with the auditors. I wasn't going to pull out my phone this time. First thing to be checked was the employee records, which didn't take too much time as we were all present. The second was the inventory records, and the final one was the financial records. When it got time for the inventory audit, the store manager, aka Jezebel, was summoned to present all the inventory records since the last audit, which she gleefully did. Auditing the inventory statistics always took hours to complete. So after a few hours without any issues, she probably thought she was in the clear. That was until she was summoned once more by the head of our department. I thought to myself, this is it. And indeed, it was. Shortly after she went into his office, we began to hear some arguing and reprimanding, and a few minutes later, she came out with a few documents visibly more sweaty than she was when she went in. She briskly walked over to her computer and opened her Excel spreadsheet, it was obvious she was trying to compare her written inventory records to what was on the spreadsheet. So, being the angel that I was, I walked on over to offer a hand. For some reason, she hadn't suspected any foul play from me even at this point, and this played right into my hands. I managed to convince her that her method of taking records had bugged the spreadsheet, and the only thing she could possibly do quick enough was to recount the inventory to be able to trace where the errors might have come from. I was the most computer literate employee she knew, so she believed me and set out to do a full inventory count, which usually took hours to complete. I and my other coworkers offered helping hands so the process could be done with a lot quicker. After about 35 minutes, we were done counting the necessary inventory and discovered that the balances varied by a considerable margin. She was distraught as the auditors were waiting for her updated report. She was summoned once again, this time to be queried about what might have gone wrong, and it seemed like she had no steadfast response to their questions because the reprimanding continued. At this point, I could see her eyes tear up. It was shaping up to be my best day at work. Jezebel was finally getting a taste of her own medicine. 
A few more minutes of the back and forth continued, and the owners, visibly frustrated, asked that she be given a letter of suspension for data misrepresentation. I had never heard that word being used before, but my vengeful spirit enjoyed hearing it nonetheless. Jezebel had been suspended for the rest of the week, and I was already thinking about all the extra hours I could get on my phone when she was gone. For the first time in my life, I made an evil person cry. My vengeance might have also have been evil, but that was besides the point. I had got back at her exactly the way I wanted. While she cleared her desk, I walked up to her to apologize, and she wondered why, so I told her I was able to correct the errors, but didn't because of what she did to me about the phone incident. Surprisingly, she still didn't suspect any foul play for me, and just looked really sad that I made her go through all of that. I didn't mind the tears though, at least she learned to never test my boundaries ever again. Honestly, I know OP said they were 16, but I think they should have tried reporting that behavior. Your employer or your boss or your supervisor or whatever can't just keep a hold of your personal property for 24 hours as a way to punish you for your work, let alone something as important as your own phone that you may need for getting back home, you're 16. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.